Okay, hello everybody and welcome to the Woodrow Wilson Center, the nation's official memorial to the 28th President of the United States and a forum or arena where good, good policy and good scholarship can come together just as Woodrow Wilson would have liked it. My name is Bryce Wakefield and I'm an Asia Program Associate here at the Center. And when we at the Asia Program sat down to talk about when to hold this event, we were hoping to make it as close to the dissolution of the Japanese national diet as possible. And I'm glad to say we nailed it. Um, Aso, Taro Aso, the Prime Minister of Japan, has today, of course, called uh, the dissolution. And Aso is in trouble. His personal polls, as well as those of his party, are hovering somewhere between 15 and 20 percent and once loyal party members are now in open revolt. More and more commentators are suggesting that the LDP will fall at the next election and the opposition party, the DPJ, will become the new part, uh, government of Japan, the Democratic Party of Japan. Who these contenders are, of course, is the subject of today's discussion. For no matter whether the LDP falls, the DPJ will in future be an important part of the politi political landscape in Japan. So to help us understand a little bit more about the DPJ, we have um, today our speakers, Ko Maida, Dan Snyder, and Richard Katz. Ko Maida is an assistant professor of political science at the University of North Texas. He did his undergraduate work at Tsukuba University in uh, Japan and his postgraduate work at the University of Michigan. No, no, no. Michigan State. Sorry, Michigan State <laughs> University. Oh, oh. Oh. <laughs> Those are them's fighting words. Okay. And he's published a number of scholarly publications and journals like the British Journal of Political Science, Comparative Political Studies, and Electoral Studies. Uh, he's going to talk to us today about the political conditions that have fostered the rise of two-party politics in Japan and have enabled uh, the situation that we're in today. Daniel Snyder is an Associate Director for Research at the Walter H. Shorenstein Asia Pacific Center at Stanford University. Dan has a long career as a foreign correspondent and his writings have appeared in the Far Eastern Economic Review, Time, the International Herald Tribune, and the Financial Times, among other publications. From 1985 to 1990, he was also the Christian Science Monitor's uh, Tokyo correspondent. Uh, he also recently interviewed the former leader of the DPJ, Ozawa Ichiro, as well as other members of the party. He'll talk to us today about the views within the DPJ on foreign policy and relations with the United States. Richard Katz is the editor-in-chief of The Oriental Economist, with responsibility for coordinating the news uh, newsletter's coverage of the Japanese economy. A Japan watcher for 25 years, Katz is also a special correspondent for the weekly Toyo Keizai, a leading Japanese business magazine. He's the author of Japan, The System That Soured, and Japanese Phoenix, two very penetrating books on the Japanese economy. His articles appeared, have appeared in a number of newspapers, and his longer essays have appeared in Foreign Affairs and the Washington Quarterly. Um, if you could all join me in welcoming our speakers here today. Thanks. So if we could uh, start with Professor Maida. Thank you very much. I am Ko Maida. I'm going to talk about the changing nature of electoral competition in Japan and what that means to the Democratic Party in the, the upcoming election. This is the outline of my talk. First, as an introduction, I'm going to provide some background information and talk about the electoral system reform of 1994. Then, second, using the data of recent election results, I'm going to show that the elections are actually becoming party-centered. More specifically, I'm going to show that the electoral trends are becoming nationalized and, and a two-party competition has been emerging. Then finally, some prospects for the upcoming election. I'm not going to make a prediction, but I'm going to show some simulated results and then uh, discuss what needs to happen for the DPJ to win power. So first, is an alternation in government finally coming to Japan? 
the approval rate for the Prime Minister uh, Arthur's cabinet is 18.6% in a recent poll. Of course, this is a very low number. Okay, does that mean the, DP, the LDP is doomed? In most other democracies, this level of approval rate will automatically mean a defeat for the ruling party. But looking back at the history of Japanese elections, there have been these cases. In, just before the 1976 election, Prime Minister Miki's approval rate was 19.4%. In 2000, Mr. Mori had 18.2%. In both elections, the LDP was able to stay in office by winning about half of the seats with this low level of approval rate. Why did that happen? It's because the elections were candidate-centered. The electoral campaigns were based on candidates' personal beliefs and achievements rather than policies of the parties. So the policies or the popularities of the parties didn't really matter. There were many voters who thought, oh, I don't like the current prime minister, but our local representative is a good man. He has done a lot to this area. We still like him. Even though the prime minister is bad, we we'll still keep voting for him. So many LDP politicians were supported by those kinds of voters. Also, many or well, all LDP politicians maintained a local support organization called Koenkai in Japanese. Those, those are different from the party's local branches, but they were organized to support individual politicians. So some people say that those practices in politics are based on culture. Okay, if it's by culture, things don't change greatly over time. Then, if elections are still candidate-centered, then however unpopular Mr. Aso is, many LDP incumbents are unbeatable because they are still supported by local supporters. So that's why it is important to ask whether the elections are still candidate-centered or it, uh, it is changing to a party-based competition. Then in talking about the, the nature of electoral competition, we have to look at the electoral system. The, in the old system that was used until 1993, each voter can cast one ballot for a candidate, for an individual candidate, and three to five members were elected from each district. So for larger parties like the LDP, it was common to nominate more than one candidate in the district. Let's look at an example. This is the result of the Kanagawa second district in the 1990 election. Uh, five seats were allocated to this district. Mr. Koizumi, who later became the prime minister, won the most votes. Then the top five were elected. Then we can see that there are two LDP candidates there. In most situations, there was no coordination between those candidates who are from the same party, but they just competed. So LDP politicians had to compete against candidates from other parties as well as other LDP candidates. That's why they couldn't simply rely on the name of the party and talk about the policies of the party, but they had, to, they had to differentiate themselves from other LDP members. So talk about the local issues or personal achievement. I built this highway here to cultivate local, uh, local and personal votes. So the electoral system, the electoral system encouraged that kind of uh, candidate-based elections. Then, the new system is made up by two separate components, and each, each voter has two ballots. 300 members are elected from 300 single-member districts. We call, we call it SMD. And 180 members are elected from 11 regional districts, and the seats are proportionally allocated to parties based on the vote shares. Then, in SMD, since only one, one seat is, avail is available in a district, parties don't nominate multiple candidates. That, that would be stupid. Then in PR, voters vote for parties. So 
candidates from the same party no longer compete against each other under the new system. So it was expected that this reform would bring about party-based and policy-oriented electoral competition as opposed to candidate-centered and pork barrel oriented politics. Then let's move on to the second part of my talk. I'm going to show some evidence that elections are indeed becoming party-centered. These histograms show the distribution of votes, vote shares in SMD from 0 to 100 for LDP and DPJ in the last three elections, 2000, 2003, and 2005. Then we can see that the variation of vote shares is indeed becoming smaller recently. So in the past, there were those strong candidates and weak candidates. But now, the, those candidate-specific or district-specific factors are be becoming less important. And the, the electoral fortunes of candidates from the same party are becoming similar. So the, the electoral performance of them are increasingly influenced by the popularity of the party or the party leader. That's true for both uh, the LDP and the DPJ. And especially in the 2005 election, some LDP candidates who had absolutely no local ties were still elected. So voters associated them with the party or Mr. Koizumi and then voted for them. That's unthinkable under the old system. So that's a, that's, that's a change we can observe. Next, these graphs show the vote change in SMD and PR. The, the horizontal axis is for the change or the swing in PR, proportional representation. The vertical axis is the change in SMD, single member district. For example, say this little circle, this is a single member district in which the LDP increased the PR vote share by like eight, eight percent. Then in the SMD, the vote share increased by like 35%. So if people vote based on their party support, the, the swing in the two components will be the same or similar. So in that case, those observations will be lined up on the 45 degree line. Then here in this election, in most of those districts, the LDP lost the PR vote. Yeah, the Prime Minister Mori was very unpopular. So the, the, the LDP's party support declined a lot. But at the same time, a majority of SMD candidates actually increased their votes. So the, the PR votes and SMD votes were like, independent. But now things are changing in the most recent election, a large majority of districts are located along this 45 degree line or cl close to this line. So the, the pattern of electoral competition is becoming nationalized, suggesting that the, the people are now voting based on parties rather than candidate specific or district specific issues like who the candidate is or what the candidate has done to that area. So the elections are gradually becoming party-centered. And also elections are becoming a, becoming a competition between two major parties. In these graphs, the horizontal axis shows the DPJ's vote change in SMD. Then the, the vertical axis is for the D, D, so the, the horizontal axis is for the LDP, the vertical axis is for the DPJ. There's no pattern here and here, but here. In this, this, this is for the change from 2003 to 2005. A large majority of districts are located here, crossed out in this area. In those districts, the amount of votes the LDP won was about the same as the amount of votes the DP, DPJ lost. So the elections are becoming a, like a zero-sum game. One party wins, the other party has to lose. In the past, it was not like this. So in those districts, or in those districts, both, both parties increased the vote share. 
So in other words, probably we, we can say that the both of the two parties have grown and reached the point at which they now compete only face to face. One party's gain has to come from the other party's loss. This point will be clearer with the next graph. This graph shows the changes in the party's seat share since 2000. May 2000, this is the situation before the 2000 election. Then this is after the 2000 election, after the 2003 election, after the 2005 election. First, Komeito, this yellow party, this has been stable. This party is supported by loyal and energetic supporters, so it's stable. Then, up until this, this point, the ruling party's seat share didn't really change. Didn't change greatly. So that means the rise of the DPJ in this blue area, the rise of the DPJ from 2000 to 2003, was achieved at the expense of other opposition parties, not at the expense of the ruling parties. So the Social Democratic Party, I believe it's this one, and the Communist Party, this one, became smaller. Then the Liberal Party, this one, joined the DPJ. So now, after the 2005 election, other opposition parties are very small, just, just like this. So if the DPJ is to win in the next election, it has to win, win seat from the LDP, something it has never done so far, at least in the lower house elections. Okay, now finally some prospects for the, for the 2009 election. First, I'm going, going to talk about the SMD, single member district, then PR proportional representation, and finally the total. In the 2000 election, the LDP won a major victory. So this, this, table, this table shows the numbers of SMD winners in 2003 and 2005. The LDP gained about 50 seats. The DPJ lost about 50 seats. So the DPJ's SMD seats reduced to less than half. That was a huge loss for them. But the vote shares in SMD didn't change that greatly. This table shows the average vote shares of the two parties in SMD. So the LDP gained about 3%. DPJ lost about 3%. So a relatively small change in votes can make a big difference in seats in SMD. It's because in a very competitive race, like 50, 51, 49, the winners still win the seat. The loser gets zero. So that's why, the, that's why changes in votes are magnified in the final result in this electoral system. Does that mean the DPJ only needs a small vote gain to win in the next election? The answer is no. It's because many LDP incumbents were elected with a relatively large margin in the 2005 election. This histogram shows the, uh, the LDP incumbents' margins to the, the runner-ups in the last election. So those are the candidates who won a close race, and those are the candidates who are easily elected. There are 73 LDP incumbents who won more than the tw more than 20 percent margin. So those people will be difficult to defeat. So in the last election, more than half of the DPJ incumbents were defeated, because most of them had a small margin when they were elected in the 2003 election. But the LDP is different. Many of them have a comfortable margin in their home district. So how much increase in votes does the DPJ need to win in the next election? Here's a result of a simple, very simple simulation. The horizontal axis shows the swing to the DPJ in the percentage of votes. Then uh, the red line is the SMD seats of the, the, the LDP, and the blue line is for the DPJ. I, I chose this red-blue coding to be consistent with American politics. 
<laughs> so then, zero swing. Zero swing means no change from 2005. In that case, the LDP will win hugely, like 220 or 30 out of 300. Then the DPJ just like 50. Then 1% change, okay, this means 1% of votes shift from the LDP to DPJ in all 300 districts. In that, in that case, the LDP's seats will decline by this. Then the DPJ seat will go up by this. Then 2%, 3%. Okay, 3%. A 3% swing will be a reversion to the level of 2003. Then at about 6%, the two parties will be tied. So that means the, the electoral swing to the DPJ will have to be about twice as large as the swing the LDP won in the last election. That's not an easy thing. Okay, now let's look at the PR component. This graph shows the PR vote shares of the two parties in 2003 lower house election, 2004 upper house election, 2005 lower house, 2007 upper house. So the two parties' vote shares didn't change greatly. Then the dashed lines show the support rates of the two parties in the last election before those elections. So interestingly, the DPJ has been winning more votes than its support rate. Then the LDP has been winning less votes than its support rate. Somehow the, the difference has been almost constant. Then the two parties' support rates right now is like this. Okay, then, if the sa same pattern continues, same pattern continues, the, the result will be like this. Okay, then, if this happens, the LDP will win 40 seats, DPJ will win 97 seats out of 180 seats allocated to the PR component. I don't think things will go this simple. It's not going to be as, as simple, but this is like a one potential outcome. Probably, probably this will be the best scenario for the DPJ. Okay, then let's calculate the total. If five, a 5% five swing goes to the DPJ, according to the simple simulation we saw earlier, the two parties' vote, the two parties' seats in SMD will be this. Then, in the best scenario, for the DPJ in PL, this. The total will be this. The, the DPJ will win slightly more seats than the LDP. And then, Komeito, it they may maintain its current strength at about 30. Other opposition parties, except for the Communists, namely the Social Democratic Party and People's New Party, the, the DPJ is considering forming a, a, a coalition with them, then whenever the DPJ goes up, other opposition parties go down. That's the pattern. So the, the Social Democratic Party and the People's New Party, right now they have 14 seats. So let's say they may win 10. Then the total will be this. The ruling coalition, 238, DPJ and allies, 220. So, a 5% swing in SMD and the best scenario in PR will not be still enough for the DPJ. Again, I'm not making a prediction. I'm just showing one potential outcome, but I hope my point is clear. The DPJ needs a large swing to win power, not a 5%, probably 6% or 7%. And then, of, of course, if the PR result will not be as favorable to them as this, the swing in the SMD will have to be even larger, like 8%. Okay, then, how big is it? In the United Kingdom, elections are known to be party-centered. Then, in, in the 1997 election, the Le British Labour Party won a landslide victory, led by Tony Blair. In that election, the vote gain of the Labour Party was 8.8%. 8.8%. That's, that's the largest vote gain of either of the two major parties in Britain since the end of World War II. So if the DPJ 
is to win in this election, the swing will, ha will have to be close to that level. That's big. That's big. Of course, it may happen. It may happen. But if, if that happens, the election has to be a very much party-centered one. We have seen that the elections are gradually becoming party-centered. Then, for the DPJ to win in this election, it will have to be very highly, strongly party-centered election. So, once again, my point is that whether the elections are changing, whether the nature of elections are still candidate-centered or party-centered, is important. And actually, in this election, that will determine the outcome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Maida. Our next speaker is uh, Daniel Snyder, who will be talking on uh, foreign policy and divisions within the DPJ. Um, thank you very much to Bryce and to the Woodrow Wilson Center for inviting me here. I don't make it all the way across the country that often, so um, it's nice to, uh, to be here, and it's nice to see a lot of old friends in the crowd, some Stanford students as well. And uh, I, uh, the reason I came is that, more than anything else, is that I've been reading a fair amount about people talking about what the implications of a DPJ victory in the elections might mean for uh, Japanese foreign policy and for U.S.-Japan relations, and most of what I've read I found I disagreed with uh, quite a bit, so I thought I should take the opportunity to uh, tell you why I disagree with it. In some sense, I've given you the uh, punchline uh, with my title, uh, because the, uh, what you see out there is a discussion, uh, at least I've seen a fair amount, that says, well, you know, a DPJ victory will bring to power a uh, left-of-center government in Japan, uh, that will have some serious implications for U.S.-Japan relations, uh, for our security alliance, uh, that we're going to end up with uh, in, a, in a sort of left-wing play on Ishihara Shintaro's infamous book, A Japan That Can Say No. Uh, I, I'm suggesting that we're not going to end up with a Japan uh, that can say no. We're going to end up with uh, a Japan that can say maybe. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Um, what I want to go through, and I'll try and do it fairly quickly, is to, first of all, and this is, a, I know, a very well-informed audience, so I, I won't dwell too much on this, but the sort of what the foreign policy discourse is in Japan, so we could sort of put the DPJ in some kind of context. Secondly, I want to deal with the idea that's, again, I, I've seen quite a bit in print, which is that the DPJ is uh, hopelessly internally divided along ideological lines. Uh, they're incapable of coming up with a coherent uh, foreign policy. So I want to look at what actually is the internal composition of the DPJ from the point of view of, uh, of foreign policy issues. Uh, third, I want to look at the DPJ leadership and its views um, the, the, at the senior level. And uh, then I want to look at the DPJ position on some key issues, particularly those relating to U.S.-Japan relations, and then draw my, my conclusions. Uh, this is based upon, uh, in, in part, uh, a set of interviews I did uh, earlier this spring in March, sort of looking forward to uh, what I thought would be uh, a very important election in Japan, the possibility of the opposition would come to power. So I had to question myself, what, what would the foreign policy of a, a DPJ government look like? So I spent some time in Tokyo interviewing uh, people from different parts of the party, including I spent, as, as Bryce mentioned, quite a bit of time with uh, Mr. Ozawa. Actually, I saw him on the morning of the day in which uh, his political sec his secretary was arrested. Uh, uh, he, he didn't know about that, I'm pretty sure, because he was very relaxed and we had a long talk. Uh, that news broke later in the day. Um, so, uh, but, and, and I remain convinced, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, that uh, despite uh, those, those uh, events, uh, he will be the most important uh, voice uh, in the DPJ, particularly when it comes to foreign policy, but we'll, we'll come to that. 
So uh, this is a slide that uh, you won't be able to read um, that comes from uh, Dick Samuels, uh, who wrote a really terrific book, I think, on, uh, on Japanese foreign policy. i am only pu uh, put th this in a subsequent slide uh, to say that what, what Dick uh, argues is that there's a sort of, there's long strands of continuity in the discourse and the debate on foreign policy in Japan going back to the Meiji era, going through the 1930s and uh, the Konoe's New Order, the, the post-war Yoshida doctrine and what he talks about as the evolution towards a, a new uh, consensus in, in Japan. Uh, I, I would argue that there really are, there's one long-standing uh, underlying debate in Japanese foreign policy uh, between the, I, I might say, the sort of uh, the Westernizers and the Asianists. Uh, it, it somewhat is akin to the debate in, in Russia between uh, Slavophiles and and westernizers, uh, those who argued, as Fukuzawa Yukichi did, that Japan has to join the West, has to be part of the West in order to advance uh, its fate as a, as a great nation, and those who argued that Japan, uh, its identity and its future were, uh, are Asia-centric. Uh, now, amongst the Asianists, there, is, there are two schools. It divides up between uh, what Samuels calls the, uh, the big Japan uh, Asianists and the small Japan. Asianists and uh, big Japan he uses, or, or great Japan, you could say, uh, to refer to those who pursued an imperial path, essentially, in Asia. Small Japan refers to people like Ishibashi Tanzan, who advocated a kind of more limited uh, notion of Japan's presence in Asia, one that wasn't in open uh, conflict with other, with the Western uh, powers, and was a sort of a non-imperial path, but one that was, was Asia-centered. I, I refer to this just because I'm going to come back to this, because I think these ideas have continuity uh, in Japanese politics to today. Um, now, this is a little easier to read. Um, Dick also took a look at sort of two axes of uh, the security discourse in Japan, uh, one being the debate over the use of force, and the other being the relationship distance or, or closeness to the United States. Uh, he puts on the uh, left side of the axis, that is those who seek distance from the United States, both the what he calls pacifist, that is the traditional Japanese left, uh, the, the Socialist Party, the Shikaito, the Kyosanto, and so on, and the neo-autonomous, that's a term he used to describe uh, what I would call the revisionist right in Japan, uh, those who are uh, the, the form of right-wing nationalism in Japan that, that fundamentally rejects um, uh, really the underlying alliance uh, with the United States and seeks uh, a, a fully independent Japan as a great power. Uh, if you go read the uh, essay of uh, General um, Kamikami, uh, uh, which caused him to be cashiered as the head of the uh, Japanese Air Force, uh, he actually articulates this quite clearly, and I spent some time talking to him also during my recent trip for a different project I'm working on. And uh, He advocates, for instance, the complete withdrawal of U.S. forces uh, from Japan. This is the man who headed the Japanese Air Force until November. So uh, that, that's, I would say, an example of that, of that school of thought. And then he puts on the other side of the axis uh, what he calls the normal nation nationalists. Uh, that's referring to Ozawa's, uh, is the credit is the inventor of that term, normal Japan needing to be a normal nation. Uh, those who seek a, a, a more assertive security role, so he puts it on the sort of use of force is okay end of the spectrum. And the middle power internationalists, those who are uh, somewhat heirs to the Yoshida tradition, but in a more narrow sense, that is that they uh, really seek a uh, Japan that uh, finds its, uh, it, uh, asserts its interest mainly through, as, as a mercantile nation, without uh, the, the use of force, the assertion of, of military power. I, I would argue that uh, if you look at the LDP and the DPJ, that the LDP uh, has a range of opinion that goes from the middle power internationalist to the normal nationalist to the neo-autonomous. The uh, DPJ uh, has a sort of swing the other way from the pacifist through the middle power internationalist to the normal nationalist. So they're, they're, both of them, if you will, include uh, one set of the extremes. Uh, but in some sense, at the core, there is actually a fair amount of consensus. Um, I think, and I don't want to dwell on this because I think this audience understands this quite well, the, the important thing to understand is that the Yoshida Doctrine, which has been the central consensus of Japanese foreign policy during the post-war period has actually evolved in a very significant way, particularly since the end of the Cold War, since the crisis over Japan's uh, support or lack of support for the first Gulf War, which caused a huge uh, crisis in Jap amongst Japanese foreign policymakers because of the perception that Japan 
uh, was a, uh, the, the, the checkbook nation that they were willing to pay but not to commit real resources uh, in a, a joint security effort. Uh, I think that set up the Japanese response to 9-11. So, you know, and there have been a series of uh, events since uh, the end of the Cold War, the first North Korean nuclear crisis, the, clearly the rise of China, uh, again, the events in North Korea, 9-11, the U.S. decision to uh, go through a restructuring of its global force deployment. All those things have triggered a policy response in Japan, which have seen a real evolution of the Yoshida doctrine to a more uh, a Japan that plays a more obvious uh, assertive security role even beyond its, uh, uh, the, the normal boundaries of the self-defense of Japan. Um, I think what we're seeing in Japan, and I believe the DPJ really represents this, is, you, uh, I mean, uh, Samuels refers to it as a new consensus. He calls it the Goldilocks consensus. <coughs> it, in some ways, it also could be understood to be a sort of further evolution of the Yoshida doctrine. The Yoshida doctrine, contrary to some uh, impressions out there, was not, did not, uh, uh, was not opposed to the uh, buildup of uh, Japan's military capabilities. Yoshida simply saw that that had to follow uh, Japan's economic recovery in the post-war period. Yoshida himself never uh, ruled out, uh, talked uh, about a Japan that did not have a significant security role. So in this uh, new consensus, I think there is what, uh, what Samuels calls a dual hedge. That is, expanding military capability, greater use of force, uh, a larger security role in global issues, but also improving relations uh, with Asian neighbors, uh, playing a more active role on the development of regional institutions in Asia, uh, and other uses of uh, other issues that are sort of more the realm of soft power, environmental protection, uh, uh, energy, that kind of thing. Uh, and, this, and the dual hedge of maintaining a close alliance with the United States, but balancing it more with a tilt uh, towards Asia. So let's, on that, with that background, look at the DPJ's foreign policy. Do they have a coherent foreign policy? What do their leadership thinks? What are the key issues? Um, and what's their role in forging a new consensus on security and foreign policy issues in Japan? This is uh, a chart of the DPJ House delegation from 2009. This is based on data that uh, uh, Steve Reed at Chuo University and Ethan Shiner have collected. Uh, and Rob Wiener, who's at the uh, Naval Postgraduate School, has been working on sort of updating that, looking at the current uh, list of, del of uh, candidates for the, for the election. Uh, and I'll explain how I divided this up. But uh, I went, uh, they've uh, looked at data which goes back and looks at the previous party backgrounds uh, of these uh, lower house members. And uh, this is sort of the, the bottom line. That is that, in fact, I would argue the DPJ is essentially a centrist party, a little bit of a left centrist party, but a, a very centrist party. And the left, which gets a lot of people I'll talk about, the ex-socialists within the DPJ, is actually a very, very small part of the DPJ and, and increasingly a very less, less and less influential part. If you break out the left, um, uh, the actual members of the old Chakaito is only 12 uh, out of the entire diet delegation. The Democratic Socialist Party is actually really, in many ways, a more conservative party than, than many people in the LDP. But I put them roughly in there just to be you know, uh, sort of as generous as possible in describing the left. Social Democrats are the uh, for, uh, socialists who have now, many of them have now started to, th this is current numbers from the DPJ's own count of people who have now affiliated themselves with the DPJ's diet delegation. So the left is actually pretty small. It's about 10 percent at most. And if you look at the current list, that is the list of people who are running for office, those numbers remain. It's very small. Um, then what I called the right is uh, those people who came out of the LDP at different times and people who came directly, whose affiliation was from the, either through a splinter party from the LDP, then to the DPJ, or stra straight from the LDP into the DPJ. Uh, and even this is a fairly generous description of the right because, for instance, Sakigake, I'd say, is a in many ways, a kind of a liberal conservative party. Uh, and you can look at the views of someone like Khan and, uh, or for that matter, Hatayama, who were in that party. And, you know, it, it would be hard to describe them as the right, if you will, in the sort of Japanese pantheon. And what I've described as the center are either those people who uh, were recruited directly to the DPJ, that is, they had no previous party affiliation, or they came out of Ozawa's many different uh, permutations, of which there are three of them here. Um, and I put Ozawa in the center, and I'll explain why a little bit more, because I think that he is the center 
uh, of the DPJ. He is the bridge between the left and the, uh, the more conservative elements of the DPJ. And he really defines, I think, what the center of the party and what its main foreign policy views are. And, and we can talk about that a little bit more. So I think uh, the bottom line for me is this is, not a, this is essentially a centrist party, uh, a little bit to the left. But you know, the range of opinion in the DPJ is really no greater. In fact, I would argue that in some ways it's, it's less uh, diverse, if you will, than the LDP is. The LDP has always had mainstream and anti-mainstream factions, differing views on foreign policy. Miyazawa's views on foreign policy were never been the same as, as Abe's. Uh, so the argument that the LDP is a coherent foreign policy and the DPJ doesn't, I think, is a specious one. There really isn't much to support that. And uh, as I said, I think you know, there are extremes in both parties, uh, but I would argue that the right-wing extreme in the LDP, that is the, the sort of uh, revisionist right in the, in the LDP, is far more powerful than the left-wing extreme is in the DPJ. So let's look at the DPJ leadership. Um, and uh, they beat the, by the, these terms, these titles, by the way, acting president or the DPJ's titles, I believe me, I have no idea what that actually means. Um, but let, let's go through it. I don't talk about Khan because I don't think Khan really is a player on foreign policy issues. He's much more of a player on domestic policy issues. Uh, and then I'll talk about some other people as well. So let's look at Hatayama first of all. I think one of the things that's important to understand about Hatayama is that uh, he really has a strong a sense of identification with his grandfather who was the prime minister in the mid-50s. And one thing to remember about uh, Ichiro Hatayama is that um, he is an interesting figure in the policy debates in Japan in the 1950s. Uh, he was a critic of Yoshida's, but he also was, as prime minister, the one who sought to uh, normalize relations with the Soviet Union and uh, was an advocate of normalization of relations with the PRC. He wasn't an uh, axiomatic uh, follower, if you will, of uh, of the United States even then. He's always been a little bit, he was always a little bit more independent. And he was uh, at various times allied as well with Ishibashi Tanzan, who followed him briefly uh, in, in his views of, a, of a small, the small Japan view. So Hatayama has an interesting sort of political uh, ideological lineage in that sense. And as I said, as far as I know, he has a very strong sense of identification with his, his grandfather. Uh, you know his sort of personal history there. He's from Hokkaido, and, uh, and you know, uh, foreign policy in Japan is like foreign policy here. There's always there's domestic policy elements to foreign policy. So it's not surprised people from Hokkaido tend to focus a lot on Russia and the Soviet Union for obvious reasons, and so he has a strong interest in, in Russia. Um, I, I wanted to give you this quote from Hatoyama because uh, on the issue, I think this is an important issue, that is the issue of the uh, collective defense issue, and I, I hopefully people know the background of this, I won't bother going through it. He has, he has certainly advocated some degree of constitutional revision uh, and, and a limited use of the right of collective defense to come to the defense of the United States. Uh, and uh, uh, use of force during UN uh, operations. But he also has been fairly clear in that he doesn't support uh, the dispatch of missions that aren't uh, directly related to Japan's security, that is self-defense, without UN authorization. Uh, and I think the quote on the right, which is a fairly recent one, um, gives you a sense that he, you know, even though Hatayama is considered, I think, by many people to be sort of on the conservative side of the DPJ, he's well within uh, what I would argue is this centrist consensus in the DPJ. He's also personally very close to Ozawa, so uh, I think in many ways he reflects Ozawa's views on a lot of these issues. Uh, then Okada, um, who uh, went with, he was one of the, he, he was very close to Ozawa early on. He went with Ozawa to form uh, the Shinsei Toho in 1993. There's been some tension between them of late uh, because of Okada's uh, ambitions uh, uh, to uh, to grab the leadership of the party after Ozawa's fall, but I, I think that uh, they're still, in many ways, philosophically, and maybe not so much personally, but still quite close. Okada, I would argue, is actually more on the, if there's a left, if you will, a genuine left in the DBJ, he's it. Uh, he's a real liberal in the sort of classic, although he comes out of the LDP, which just shows you why these labels are, are you have to be careful of them. Uh, he, he's a very strong advocate of nuclear disarmament and nonproliferation. He headed a diet committee on this, a uh, diet caucus on this. He is a big enthusiast for Obama's uh, nuclear weapons uh, policies. Uh, he calls for the U.S. to renounce uh, first use of nuclear weapons against non-nuclear powers. Uh, he wants to kind of create a nuclear-free zone in Northeast Asia, as you can see from, and these are from a very recent interview with uh, Sekai magazine from this earlier this month. 
Uh, he says, priority should be given to Asia first, then to the U.S.-Japan alliance. Uh, we should pursue uh, the creation of an East Asian community. Uh, and uh, he wants to have a serious discussion about U.S. base uh, structure uh, in, in Okinawa, and we'll come back to, to this issue. So I'd say, you know, he really has staked out kind of, if you will, if there's a, 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 a you know, a, a, a liberal left position in the DPJ, he's it. Um, the actual left, that is the hardcore left, uh, uh, that is really represented by people like uh, Sengoku, who I spent some time with. Uh, he may, uh, he's a very powerful figure in the party. He was a former head of the Policy Affairs Committee in the DPJ. Uh, he's a critic of Ozawa's, but I, I expect him to emerge in a, a leadership position uh, in a DPJ government. Um, he's a very smart man. Uh, he's an old style, in many ways, uh, Socialist Party guy. Um, a serious, very serious intellectual. Um, I had a long chat with him, which I found really interesting. In many ways, he's one of the most interesting people I've found to talk to amongst the Diet delegation. Um, he is very Asia-centered, doesn't believe Japan should play a global role, really, that Japan's foreign policy should be Asia-focused. Uh, he wants to, he says, talk about creating a system of co-governance uh, with the U.S., China, Japan, and Korea. He's very focused on the need to improve the relationship with China and Korea. Um, he interestingly supports uh, PKO deployments. He doesn't oppose the security alliance, but I wouldn't call him an enthusiast for it. Um, but his emphasis is on Japan expanding its PKO uh, role. Um, and uh, he advocates creating a, for instance, a PKO training center together with the Chinese and the Koreans in Asia for operations in Asia. Again, he's very Asia-centric. So uh, that, if you want to find a kind of a true left, if you will, in the DPJ, this would be it. Um, the right, this is a person everybody here knows because he comes to Washington all the time um, and, uh, and uh, he's much talked about as a potential uh, defense minister. I don't know if that's going to happen I think, uh, since he very openly opposed Ozawa in the, uh, earlier this spring, but we'll see. Um, but uh, even Maihara, I think it's important to understand that he is not, you know, he I, again sits within, uh, I can think, the boundary lines of this, of this centrist consensus. Although he's a very strong supporter of the alliance, uh, he also opposed the extension of the uh, MSDF mission to the Indian Ocean um, for the main reasons that the party as a whole opposed it, which I'll come to in a bit. Uh, he supports the renegotiation of the uh, base realignment agreement, particularly regarding uh, the uh, relocation of the Fukutenma Air Station. Um, and, but he's probably stronger, more clearly a supporter of the exercise of the right of cleft of self-defense, though within the boundaries of, uh, of the law. I thought that this quote on the right was really interesting. This is a speech he gave here in Washington that even though uh, I'd say he kind of stakes out, if you will, the right of the DPJ, he's very careful on the sort of China threat issue. And if you look at the true right in Japan, that is the, the right of the LDP that is constantly talking about the China threat, uh, I wouldn't put him in that category at all. I mean, he sees China as a danger, but uh, also uh, worries about uh, engaging in the kind of activity that would, in fact, in, you know, uh, draw even harsher lines between Japan and China. So again, I think it sort of defines, if you will, sort of the limit, the, the boundary lines of this consensus. And then we come to uh, the man behind the curtain, um, and I'm sure questions will come up about this. I don't want to go through his history, which you all know. Um, I, I I wanted to do two things. One, this is what Ozawa said in his. Uh, book uh, that was published first in, in Japanese and then later in English as Blueprint for a New Japan in 1993, uh, because I think there's a lot of misunderstanding of his views. Um, uh, I, I think his views have actually been fairly consistent over a long period of time. I've known him, as some people in this audience have known him much longer than I have, but I've known him for at least 20 years, and uh, uh, he's been saying the same things to me and to others for pretty much all that period of time. So. Uh, this is what he said about the alliance relationship with the U.S. Um, he, he saw at the end of the Cold War, and he was very troubled by the Gulf War, uh, Japan's failure to act and support the U.S. in the Gulf War. He was a spearhead of the attempt to get Japan to commit actual military forces. Uh, he was uh, very unhappy about that. This is when he was in the LDP. Uh, and the conclusions he drew from that was that Japan, in order for Japan to act as a normal nation, to be able to take on a more normal security role, that it, it would still, it would have to do that within two, uh, basically, two limits. One, 
uh, the reaction of its neighbors in Asia, that is China and Korea, that they couldn't alarm others about the possibility of the resumption of, uh, of, a, of a Japanese militarism or the threat of a Japanese militarism, and that they had to do it within, very much within the confines of the US-Japan alliance, and, and that it, they were bound by the restrictions of the Japanese constitution, which he did not believe could be uh, fundamentally changed. He thought it could be modified, but not fundamentally changed. And therefore, he came up with this idea that the best way to get Japan to do that was to do that uh, in the context of UN peacekeeping operations, uh, which he believed were constitutional uh, and, and would allow Japan to, including he saw the PKO operations in which Japan could return fire, could have rules of engagement that were the same as others, but that that, that, that was the best, that would be acceptable to their neighbors, acceptable to the Japanese population and to the U.S. This is what he said to me in March. Um, you know, he pretty much has had the same view. Uh, he believes that Japan should be more responsible for its own defense. He talks about having a more equal relationship. That's a plank of the DPJ's foreign policy. Um, you know, his criticism, he said, was not really of the United States when he called for having a more equal relationship. It was of the Japanese government for failing to define its own security policy. Um, he, he, like the rest of the party, opposed the Iraq war. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to go through all of this. He, as I said, he basically has the same views on deployment of self-defense forces under UN authorization. Uh, the issue of the Seventh Fleet remark, which I talked to him about, I mean, uh, very typically he said that in a fairly offhand manner. Uh, what was really behind it, honestly, was that he opposes the uh, relocation of Futenma. Uh, and so he didn't want to include the air forces in that, and that's why he said we only need the Seventh Fleet. Uh, I said, well, what about Kadena? What about the U.S. bases in Kadena? Uh, he said, well, no, of course, if that's as a regional security role, that has to remain. But he said uh, that should not include Futenma. So I'll just go quickly through this because I'm running out of time. Um, you know, the, the, the DPJ's position on this, again, it's been fairly clear over a period of time, and I don't think it's going to change no matter how they change their language slightly to respond to the attacks on them from the LDP. They're going to, uh, they, may, they may allow the MSDF uh, law will continue to be in place until uh, early next year, but I don't think they're going to support an extension of that uh, because they view it as being in support of the Iraq war, not, a, not for the anti-terrorism mission, and they're critical of the LDP for not being very clear about, to the Japanese public, about what these missions were really about. Um, on, this is a picture of Futenma. For those of you who don't understand the Futenma issue, this is all, you know, in the SACO agreement, all the bases south of Kadena, which sit in very densely urban populated areas, are supposed to be relocated. You know, this is a domestic political issue, particularly it's an issue in Okinawa. The DPJ's position on this, I think, is derived very much from electoral politics in Okinawa. Uh, they may uh, slightly modify it, but I don't believe that they're going to change it, even uh, if they come to power. Uh, they're going to want to relook at the base uh, relocation issues for sure, and the questions of the SOFA and the host nation support that go along with that. Uh, and this is what uh, Ozawa said to me on this question, uh, and I think this is, this is the policy of the DPJ. It will remain the policy of the DPJ, I'm fairly sure. Um, again, the, there, there is a definite Asianist tilt, if you will, to the DPJ. Uh, it, it harkens back to the sort of Ishibashi Tanzan tradition. Uh, there's a strong emphasis on East Asian regionalism. If you talk to, as I did, to the sort of foreign policy advisory types who are around the DPJ, people like Tanaka Hitoshi or Terashima, they're big advocates of uh, Asian regionalism, East Asian community, and I think that will be a central thrust of a DPJ foreign policy. And frankly, the LDP is also headed more and more in that direction. And I, I, I kind of want to get to this, if you don't mind. I think the clearest break, if you will, between the DPJ and the LDP will be on history issues. The DPJ has no problem being much more forthright in dealing with the problems of the legacy of World War II. They don't have the Abe Kishi uh, uh, line sitting in their party. And if you look at the uh, only Japanese governments that have really made any progress on dealing with historical issues have been non-LDP governments. I refer to the Hosokawa cabinet's uh, positions on, on this, particularly on comfort women, and Moroyama's uh, in a coalition with the LDP, but nonetheless it was Moriyama, a socialist statement on the time of the uh, wartime anniversary in 1995, which remains the signal important precedent
for Japanese being much more open to dealing with history issues. And I think the DPJ is very committed on this question. I spoke to Ozawa and everybody in the DPJ leadership that I met with were in agreement on this. They want to shut down Yasukuni as a shrine for war criminals. Uh, they were very, they took the leadership on going after Tamagami and raising the problems of civilian control of the military. They're the ones who raised this issue in the Diet. Uh, this is Ozawa's statement on uh, the need to be forthright in dealing with Japan's wartime aggression in Asia. Um, uh, and I think in, in many ways this may be the most important shift you'll see in Japanese foreign policy and it's very much related to their Asianist tilt, if you will. So uh, I would argue that in fact there is a growing consensus in Japan uh, in this direction. This is Abe uh, with Hu Jintao and, uh, the, uh, and I illustrate that because even Abe felt the pressure of this emergent consensus, this need to balance relations a little bit more. Um, and there's consensus on a range of other issues, on North Korea, missile defense, AMPO, concern over China. Those are fairly much shared issues across the spectrum uh, in Japanese foreign policy. And lastly, I would say that if anything, the, the divergence would have been between a DPJ government and a Bush administration. There you would have seen some fairly sharp differences. But actually with an Obama administration, I'd argue a DPJ government would probably be more in tune with American foreign policy than an LDP government uh, is or would be. Um, so lastly, you know, is this a Japan that can say no? No, it's a Japan that can say maybe. And this is a wonderful quote from uh, a person many people know who's in the DPJ's Foreign Policy Research Committee and his, uh, I think it stands for itself. I think there'll be times when the Japanese will disagree with us. Most of the time they'll agree with us. Personally, I think that's great. That's a healthy relationship. Uh, and uh, it's one that uh, I think most Americans ought to welcome. So, let me end there. Great. Thanks very much. <laughs> okay, our next speaker is Richard Katz. Sorry, I went on to pass Hi, good afternoon. Um, is one of these a, a pointer? Uh, yes. The top? The top one. This thing, okay, great. Um, what I'd like to do is try to answer uh, few questions here. One is, um, does the DPJ have, I mean, the, the big question was, can the DPJ deliver on economic revival? But let's subdivide it. First of all, does the DPJ actually have an economic policy? It was very interesting in talking to people about it a couple months ago, even very, very informed people said basically the DPJ has no, has no economic policy. Um, he just wants to spend money, just like the LDP. And or said, gee, I, I don't know if it has a policy or not. Now, in fact, the DPJ does have an economic policy. It just doesn't talk about it, um, which raises the second question. And I have a manifesto, and there's some stuff, and I'm going to go through with it. <clears throat> Is the policy a good one? Well, some parts, yeah, some parts, no. It's kind of the good, the bad, and the ugly, and I'll go through that. But, but the parts that are good are actually very good. And the third question is, can the DPJ deliver on its economic policy? And there are a couple of questions here regarding that. One is, they don't talk about it. I mean, maybe they will talk about it during this campaign, but so far they've not talked about it. They've spent a lot of time bashing bureaucrats as the root of all evil. And it seems to me it's kind of hard to get a mandate for a policy that you don't campaign on. And part of the problem with the view is that we, even inside the party, we don't really have an economic policy. We have a campaign tactic. Let's get elected and worry about what to do with it after we get elected so that people, a lot of people inside the DPJ don't take their own policy very seriously. And the other issue is can they win a majority on their own? If they're able to win a majority on their own, then they're much less dependent upon alliance with the anti-reformists represented by the socialists and by the um, People's New Party, which is really the construction lobby, the postal rebels, et cetera, whom they have to ally with somewhat because the DPJ is about, I think, three seats shy of majority in the upper house. But if they have a majority on their own, they're much more independent. So their ability to deliver really depends an awful lot on their strength. Uh, having said that, uh, what I'd like to do is to uh, uh, give my time to the gentleman from South Carolina. However, since I'm not allowed to do that, I have to actually talk. Let me try to get into the flesh of that matter here. Well, I have an apology on that, which is that I sent off the slides, and then as I went through what I wanted to talk about, the order kind of changed. So um, I'm going to have to be running back and forth in terms of ordering order here on slides, but that's okay. Um, there are a couple problems in terms of growth. 
There are a couple problems in terms of growth in Japan, which is some are on the side of a, of a chronic shortfall in demand. That is, Japan is always having insufficient domestic demand to absorb what it produces. So it's having to have artificial sources of demand in terms of huge trade surplus, budget deficits, monetary steroids that gin up private investment, et cetera. And the reason this is that consumer spending is too low because consumer income is too low. And the DPJ actually addresses this very concretely in its manifesto. If you talk to people, they're very serious about it. And it's the first time that policymakers, senior policymakers in Japan have addressed this issue in, in a really quite a rigorous way since the Mayakawa Commission back in 1986. And I'll go through the details of that a bit. But that's actually the most positive thing about it, that they actually are addressing an issue which is a reason for why Japan was so vulnerable to the global recession, why it's having the worst recession of the entire OECD, why uh, it constantly has to have these trade deficits that create tensions with other countries, uh, that sort of thing. Now, on the other hand, that meets with the demand side. But the other side of Japan's problem is that its potential growth, that is even with full employment, full demand, full use of capacity, it doesn't have the ability to grow much beyond 1.5% a year for any sustained period of time. That's not a level of growth which allows them to deal with, for example, how do you finance the growing ranks of, of retirees in Japan? How do you create a tax base? Uh, you know, this, this sort of issue. And the DPJ on this issue either has nothing to say or the things that it does say are, really, are retrograde and partly because of the way it sees its own base and the way it's dealing with its campaign tactics. So let me, and, and again, its ability to deal with that in a forthright way, which I think it will have to. Those are issues that cannot be ignored. They can be ignored for this year or next year, but they have to be addressed, and I'll discuss why. Its ability to deal with those issues, again, depend upon to what extent is it reliant upon alliance with the PNP and the, and the Social Democrats, who really are anti-reformist on this. Now, let me just see. This is, okay, this is where I'm going to zip around a little bit. Okay. Okay, this is an incredible slump, this recession Japan is going through right now. 75% of the entire growth in GDP since the recovery that began seven years ago, 75% of the entire thing was, was wiped out in a matter of three quarters, which tells you something that the, the basis for that growth must have been mighty, mighty shaky. And here you have a recession which originated in, in the United States but Japan was the worst victim of it. Why was Japan so vulnerable? Now, the question is, where is this slide? Because, of, because unfortunately, the page number was knocked off. No. Here you go. Here's the problem. If you look on the right, the problem lies in the question of lack of consumption, consumer demand. Consumption, household consumption is about 54%, more than half of entire GDP. But it accounted for only 26% of all of the growth in GDP in this recovery. The trade surplus hit that maximum of 5% of GDP, but was a third of all growth. And then we have capital investment by businesses, which is 16% of GDP, but another third of all growth. And if you look down into it, a lot of that investment was very, much, very much related to exports. So we had a growth strategy that was really, really dependent upon exports, and not just exports, but running a big trade surplus. Now, the question is, why did this occur? Okay, let's find this one. Okay, here we go. It's the way that Japan chose to recover. They recovered off the backs of the household sector. You had this huge debt problem, as we all recall. How did they recover from that? Well, by cutting wages of workers, you had this growth under, under deregulation of irregular workers, part-time and temporary workers who get paid lower wages. Not only did they not get bonuses and the fringe benefits, but the, the actual two people standing side by side doing exactly the same work, wearing different uniforms, one gets paid less than the other because one's a part-timer. And the unions accept that because they figure, keep the company alive, I keep my job, even if the person next to me gets lower wages. So wages, which are supposed to match Output wages per worker are supposed to match output per worker. That's the way it's supposed to work in the textbooks. That worked that way up until the 19, 1997 downturn. And since then, yeah, output per worker, real GDP per worker has gone up, but not the wages. 
So the profits of companies went up, not because the companies were more efficient, more productive, but because money was transferred from the wages of the workers to the profits of the company. At the same time, if you think of households as savers, money was transferred from their pockets as savers to, to, the, to the banks and therefore to the borrowers of the banks. So you take $10,000 and you pluck it down in a five-year certificate of deposit, and the interest you have over the course of an entire year is enough for you to go to Starbucks. Now, not to actually buy a cup of coffee there, but to go, right? So the reason why consumer spending was so low was because consumer income was so low. And they kept talking about passing the batons of the consumer. Man, that baton never got passed. And that is the basic problem. The problem is not that people don't want to spend. Uh, this is another chart that's sort of to show total private income as a share of GDP, not just wages, but interest income, self-employment income, mom and pop store income, et cetera, going from 68% of real GDP down to 62%. That means you've got to make up for it. So how do they spend it all? This gray area is disposable income that came from tax cuts and transfer payments, being Social Security, welfare, unemployment compensation, whatever. In other words, this, to the extent there was consumption, it was deficit financed. They, they say it's not because in the GDP tables it shows up under personal consumption, but it was financed by the government, by deficits. They also tell you, if you listen to the MOF and the newspapers, that the households refuse to loosen their purse strings. Not true. They don't have any purse strings. The savings rate has gone from about 13% here, 1991, down to about 10%, 97, 98, down to about 3% now. I believe now the Japanese save less than the Americans, and this is quite an achievement. So the idea that the Japanese refuse to spend is just wrong. They would spend if they got the money. <laughs> and that's what the DPJ is trying to do, which is to say, give them the money. Now, let me find what page that money is on, and then I will talk about it. Here we go. This is just to keep you awake as the last speaker. You've got to do something to keep people awake. All right. The idea is to throw money at the problem, which in this case is actually a good idea. They're saying if the problem with the Japanese economy, why it's so unbalanced, why it's so vulnerable to a global downturn, so a downturn of 2% or 3% in the U.S. causes a 12% annual rate of decline in Japan in the last quarter, then stop that unbalance, stop the, the, the things that cause stress with other countries, cause financial difficulties, by raising household disposable income. How? By basically give, giving the money from the government. So they have a plan over the next two years to spend 21 trillion yen, 4% of GDP, to stimulate the economy. And then it will make many of these measures permanent. So this is how they're going to shift to consumer-led growth. They say a lot of these are very child-friendly or family-friendly, which they hope would also begin to raise the birth rate, and some of the measures are copied from France. We can get into whether it will or not be effective in that area in the Q&A if you want. But one idea is just a child allowance, $3,000 per child until the child reaches the end of compulsory education, which would boost household income by an amount of about 1% of GDP or 1.3% of consumer spending. Reimburse all the expenses of public high schools and some of that at private high schools. Even at public high schools, parents spend as much as $5,000 a year because of fees, tuitions, all kinds of stuff. Uh, provide interest-free loans to finance tuition at public and private universities. I mean, this is all, to my mind, good stuff. Exempt children from medical costs until they graduate from junior high. Now, here's an interesting one. Reduce the tax burden by about half a percent of GDP by abolishing taxes that are dedicated to funding road-related projects. Okay, no more roads to nowhere, bridges to nowhere. But if they have to ally with the People's New Party, which is the party of the Postal Rebels, construction lobby, agro lobby. Will they actually do this? We don't know. Interesting question. Is it a campaign platform to win votes in certain sectors, like in the cities, but will they do it? This remains to be seen. Abolish most highway tolls, which are just incredible. You can take a trip from, I forget where it was, to Hokkaido, and the tolls are like $600. $600. So when the Oslo administration took part of it and abolished some of the um, tolls for weekends and stuff, the traffic increased a lot. And I met talked to a guy from Aon, um, the retailer, and their sales increased a lot because people went on the road, brought their cars to the malls, and, and bought. Uh, for the small and medium corporations, 
cut their tax rate in half and abolish the, the tax on the individual owners of these things. So these are all different ways to, let me see, okay. These are all different ways to give the consumer more money and believe me, the record shows that when they have the money, they will spend it. How are you gonna finance this? There you go. They haven't the foggiest idea and they don't wanna talk about it. What they say is, well, somehow we're gonna find $20 trillion worth of waste, fraud, and abuse to cut. Well, first of all, if you're in a recession, don't you actually want to expand your deficit? I mean, why do you want to find cuts equal to the amount of money you're throwing at the problem? I understand on a long-term basis you want to. It's because they don't want to just come out and say we're going to run a big deficit because somehow that seems to be irresponsible because this line about deficits being evil and all, at all times and all places has taken over Japan as something you have to say, even though in certain times it's just nonsense. So they don't say that. They don't say anything about, for the long term, since a lot of these measures want to be permanent, about how do you raise the tax base by raising the growth rate. And for the long term, which we're going to come back to, unless they have policies that, in fact, raise the growth rate, then this policy is impossible to sustain. And they have yet nothing to say about it, which I think, for the short term, matters. For the longer term, may matter less because it's an issue which they don't want to confront now, but will have to confront. And let me come back to that because I think the most important thing is not what the DPJ intends to do now, but the process that is set in motion by shaking things up that creates a fluidity that allows people to address the thing a few years down the line. But let me come back to that. At least for now, though, they haven't thought it through. And then they want to talk about a consumption tax after four years. Well, my view on the consumption tax is I'll believe it when I see it. It's always going to be in four years. Whatever year this is, it's going to be in four years. <laughs> now, so on that stuff, if they do what they say they're going to do, that's all very good. But it doesn't address the real root of the problem, which is why is the private sector economy not generating sufficient labor income? Why is the labor share of national income so low in Japan compared to international standards, so low compared to what it used to be? What are the blockages to proper fluidity in the market? It's not something they're talking about because throwing government money at the problem is a good transition, but it's not a permanent solution. And then that brings us to the other issues, which is the, which, which they don't talk about a lot, which I think they need to, which is the long-term potential growth. Now, Japan's got a demographic crunch, which is not only is the population shrinking, but that the working age population is shrinking even faster than the total population. And here's one reason why that's important. Suppose you, actually, let me, before I get to that, let me, let me leap ahead and go back. GDP growth in any country is the sum of how many hours people are working and the growth in the output per hour. Well, since 1990, the number of hours people have worked have actually been shrinking. The only source of any GDP growth whatsoever has been productivity growth. That is, each worker produces more stuff. All right, and that's average about 1.5%. Now, here's the problem. If the number of workers is shrinking even faster than the population, what happens in terms of per capita GDP? Well, for sake, it's, it's about 0.7% faster shrinkage, but for sake of arithmetic, let's call it 1%. So if the number of workers is shrinking 1% faster than the number of people, total people, then even if each worker produces 1% more GDP, the amount of GDP for the entire population is zero growth. And when more and more of those people are elderly who have all of these high health expenses, then in the real living standard, you may even have a bigger problem. So that's why there's a demographic crunch, which leads to the need to raise the growth rate of productivity. And unless Japan does that, it's going to have a problem. You can see it was catching up. That's the whole catch-up period, the post-war miracle. And since then, it's declined relative to other countries. People think of Japan as having this super great manufacturing sector. Here's the U.S. levels of productivity output per hour in manufacturing. Here's Japan. And it's gotten, it's gotten worse. When the U.S. had the productivity boom, Japan fell even further behind. Now, Japan has thought the answer to productivity is to throw money at the problem, invest a lot of money. But in fact, Japan invests more than other countries, but it still grows more slowly. And some of the cap, the investment makes no sense. For example, the supermarkets. Here's the, look at this. 
the floor area is increasing, the number of employees are increasing, the number of stores is increasing, the number of sales are not. You've heard of Bridges to Nowhere, these are stores for no one. <laughs> we were supposed to have had all this reform, which meant that the financial system would now no longer allow retailers to build all kinds of stuff that nobody needed and get into big debts and then become zombies that had to get bailouts. But that's not occurred. All the big retailers are saying, we're going to win by stealing market share. Yeah, we know the overall market's not growing, but we're going to get the market share. And they're all doing it. So what's wrong with the financial system that allows this sort of a thing to occur? But also says that's one of the reasons why they're not getting a good bang for the buck in terms of, of what they invest. And that brings us to the political problem. What causes productivity growth, and why is a DPJ going to have a problem dealing with this? And this has to do with the labor system. What causes productivity growth is fierce competition. It's one thing. So here you have, in Japan, in the sectors which are very efficient, if you do a, a, a ranking of all the companies, market share, market ranking, you see a lot of fluctuation back and forth. And that's 20% of Japan. But in the 80% that's domestic, this is what you see. So here are the top five companies in polyethylene film over a couple decades. Not one case of a change in market ranking. Not one. And the only change is that the five together have a larger share now then than they, than they had to, you know, back in 78. So the concentrations become even bigger. So where's the competition that would feed productivity? It ain't there. The other thing that really feeds productivity, I'll not go through the chart, but basically is the birth and death of firms. If you think of an economy as Darwinian evolution, imagine an ecology where you don't allow any species to die and you don't allow any new species to be born. How much evolution are you going to have? In the economy, you've got to let inferior old firms die and new fresh blood, new firms come up. But Japan's got the lowest rate of birth and death of firms in the OECD. All right, that's is right here. Now why? A lot of it has to do with the labor system. You have a, Japan's kind of a welfare society rather than a welfare state. Your job is your social safety net. Your, your, your health, your, your pension system is tied to it. Your access to unemployment compensation. How much unemployment compensation you get depends upon how long you've worked for particular companies. So you have a very long tenure. You're afraid to lose your job because you can't get an equivalent job at another company in either your own industry or a new industry. You certainly don't want to risk a good job and set up your own company because if it fails, where are you going to go? The risk-reward of being an entrepreneur is much, much the, the risk is much, much higher in Japan, much easier to be an entrepreneur here. So basically, your job is your social safety net. And therefore, you've got to protect the person's current job at their current firm, which also means you've got to protect the current firm so you can't allow too many firms to die, which means the new firm can't get staff, can't get money, can't get distribution, a lot of protectionism. Now, what Japan needs is a situation which can have both the mobility the best of market mobility, but also protection, not for the particular job, but for people as they transition from job to job. In this regard, I'll throw out they could learn a lot from Scandinavia, which has dealt with this problem, and there are people in the DPJ who are looking at that. But if you have a labor movement, which is organized around job protection, when you get in the DPJ, listen to them is to say, they view the problem as deregulation, neoliberal deregulation, caused the rise of irregular workers to one-third of the labor force, they don't have job security. They're last hired, first fired. They get lower wages. What we want to do is go back to the old-time religion before the deregulation and restore the lifetime employment and just make sure everybody has it. Of course, not everybody did, but anyway, that being aside. Well, I'm sorry. That option is not on the menu of history, in my view. You cannot put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And the problem is this limited view that there are only two options, either reform of the sort of the neoliberal Thatcherite Reagan stripe, which Koizumi tried, or else old, LD, I call it LDP socialism. This is socialism that kind of worked for a while and then stopped, right? Because times changed. So the idea that there are other varieties of capitalism which can be tried is not that well known in Japan. And so within, if you speak to people in the DPJ, you get people who, who basically want to go back to that job protection system which helped lead to the lost decade, and other people who are looking around for new alternatives to say, okay, how can we have a high-wage economy but also market flexibility? How do we protect not the particular job but the workers that go from job to job? This is a debate that DPJ has to have, has not have, so they have nothing to say about structural reform at all. They just don't talk about it. 
the extent they do, they talk about basically you know, making part-timers eligible for unemployment compensation, which is a kind of a social safety net issue. They are actually retrograde on agricultural protectionism, partly because Ozawa needs those rural districts in order to, for the DPJ to win. So I don't think you see much on that, and that actually bears on a lot of other issues that has spillover effects. So that I see the positive side, if you look at the, 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 bad, the good, the bad, and the ugly, the good is on the demand stuff, very good if they do what they say they're going to do. On the structure reform, bad in the sense they don't talk about it, but some of the stuff they do talk about is actually ugly. Now, how much does that matter? It depends on your time frame. And here I would like to end on an optimistic note. It seems to me, as I started to say, the most important thing about the election, assuming the DPJ wins solidly, and it would be really great if, I, if they got a lower house single party majority, is that it would shake things up and then it had getting a majority in the upper house election. Then you have the LDP out of power for at least four years till the next upper house election and lower house election. If that were the case, I am not sure the LDP would still exist in four years if the nexus between the LDP and the finance and the budget is, is cut. And that would change Japan to more toward elections, which are just as party-centered and policy-centered elections, which would be good for Japan in contested elections. The LDP might go the way the Italian Christian Democrats. But the issues of how do you fund the agent, how do you finance these very nice things you want to do, how do you raise the tax base, how do people have pensions if return to capital is lousy, all of those issues have got to be addressed because the ability of politicians to get elected and re-elected depends upon it. Let's assume the DPJ does really, really well in this election. What I will have shown is that in two lower house elections in a row, the population voted massively for reform and change. And if they don't get it, what happens to the election after that? And therefore, I think these long-term fundamental economic issues, questions that have to have answers, and the need of politicians to get reelected come together. They don't come together in 2009 and 2010 in terms of the DPJ's ability to win and stay in power until they get to the upper house, but they do have salience when we start talking about you know, 2013 and, and beyond. And so I think one way or the other, they're going to have to have that debate inside the DPJ. And who knows if the DPJ will be the form in seven or eight years. We may have several more political realignments. But those issues will be addressed. And what a DPJ victory would mean for economic revival is to shake up the inertia, shake up the rigidity, and to allow possibilities which do not, are not now possible because of the institutional rigidity. That, to me, is the most important economic effect of a DPJ victory. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Very good. Okay, we've got uh, just over or just under 40 minutes for questions. Um, we do have uh, microphones coming around to you. If uh, you'd just uh, raise your hand and wait um, if you've got a question for um, one of our microphone holders to come to you. Could I ask, um, could you please identify yourself? Uh, could you s state your name and affiliation? Thanks. Hi, thanks. Uh, Paul Eckert of Reuters News Agency here in Washington. Uh, for Mr. Snyder, mainly because he did talk about foreign policy, I wonder if you could sketch out, you did a great job in setting up, and I tend to get the sense that the Obama administration uh, relationship that you sketched out at the very end was good, but sort of what, could a different, what sort of differences could there be, say, on North Korea where you know, this, this abductee issue remains a sensitive issue, I think, no matter who, who, who's in power, and uh, let's say Afghanistan, or might, might the Obama administration be able to get more help from a friendly DPJ government, that sort of thing? Um, on North Korea, I would say that um, yeah, although there, as I said, there's a fair amount of consensus in Japan on North Korea. That is, for example, uh, I, when I was there, this is when the, uh, the North Koreans were preparing for their uh, last missile test. And I asked all the DPJ people that I spoke to, what would you, would you approve of shooting down um, a North Korean missile if, you, if they thought it was going to fall in Japan? This was uh, you know, the big issue at the time. And even uh, Hachiro, who was the shadow foreign minister of the 
DPJ, and as a former socialist, said, oh, yes, you know, we should shoot down the, the missile. So I, I think, in fact, and, and the Ozawa's criticism on North Korea is that the U.S. neglected the North Korean nuclear issue in favor of uh, dealing, uh, focusing on Iraq. So if anything, I don't think the DPJ differs fundamentally with the LDP on uh, being deeply concerned about a nuclear North Korea. I'd say there are two differences, slight differences. One is I think the DPJ maybe leans a little bit more towards uh, the use of diplomacy, and, and partly that's you know the influence of people like Tanaka. Uh, but after all, don't forget that Tanaka was the architect of Koizumi's approaches to uh, North Korea. So again, I don't think it's really a partisan difference. Um, and uh, they're not as they're not tied to the abductee lobby. Uh, the tea lobby is a pretty powerful domestic political lobby in Japan, uh, and which Abe, for example, was a major uh, force behind, if not a leader of. That that lobby is not really present in that way in the in the DPJ. So I don't expect them. I expect them to be more ready to uh, give priority to solution of the nuclear issue over the abductee issue, and more ready to be flexible on dealing with that, frankly, than an LDP government. Um, on the, uh, the sec on Afghanistan, well, Ozawa, you know, a long time ago, at the time when the uh, DPJ opposed the extension of the uh, maritime self-defense force deployment to the Indian Ocean, he argued that Japan should be ready to uh, participate in uh, the Afghan uh, support of the Afghan operations, even in ISAF, because that was a UN authorized mission, and therefore, under his terms of what would be permissible, that it would be permissible for Japan to participate in that. Now, after having said that, the DPJ has really backed off, including Ozawa, has really backed off from the idea of uh, military participation. Uh, but I think the, the DPJ has been fairly uh, supportive of non military. Uh, a non non military role in Afghanistan, either in the form of economic aid or logistics or other type of support. Right down the front here, Miriam. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Um, terrific presentations, and if you think I'm going to be able to boil these things down so everybody else can copy my notes, you could forget about it. <laughs> but uh, uh, moving right along, um, let's go right back to the start. We've been reading here for the last few days that. Um, uh, the latest polls show a potential wipeout uh, for the, the uh, uh, for the LDP uh, LDP getting wiped out. On the radio this morning, they were talking about uh, you know 60, 65 percent versus uh, you know uh, perhaps below 40 percent. Uh, here in in our system, if there's a party differential of six or eight or nine points the outcome per seat is huge in Congress. Um, from what you've been saying, Professor Maida, uh, in, in the way the Japanese system is evolving, um, are, are we seeing now a, such a big spread, a stated preference for the, 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 the Japan Democratic Party that a similar uh, uh, victory may be in the cards? And I ask because y your presentation in a sense, was the most pessimistic thing that we've heard in quite a while. I don't mean that as a criticism, but uh, you know, we were all sort of hearing, "Whoa, we haven't heard that." Whoa, my, you know, uh, you were saying, "Yeah, it's going to be a lot closer than anybody thinks." And if they don't get at least eight point eight, they ain't going to win. So, uh, uh, but what's your sense of uh, of the spread that we are hearing, and 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 how you seeing the outcome? I mean, thanks very much, to all three of you. Yeah. So. So again, my point is whether elections are, I mean, how party-centered it is. It is if it is perfectly party-centered, of course, it will be a landslide. landslide. The DPJ, DPJ will win the out, outright majority. But uh, so, but that scenario is something we completely ignore the candidate factor that for for the uh, for for candidates who have strong support. Uh, base or who who has maintained the seat for like 20 years or so. So it depends on many factors, but I think, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to make a, make a prediction, but if the trend that we saw that uh, the elections are becoming party-centered really continues, then, then I probably the result will be uh, similar to what Many mass, mass media are seeing, saying. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, sorry, I, I don't make a prediction. So. 
I wonder if I could follow that up. Um, early signs are, and um, this is if you look at the internet advertising that the LDP is already putting out, a lot of it's quite negative. Now, doesn't it matter how, in what way it is party-centered? Because if there's a lot of negative campaigning on both sides, and it looks like there's going to be, isn't, that, isn't there the possibility that that will, you know, negative campaigning um, tends to uh, foreshadow a low turnout, isn't there a possibility, which will favour the LDP, isn't there a possibility that that might happen? I don't know. I, I mean, you're talking, I'm talking about, you know, mm. you're talking about party-centred electoral politics, mm. but, um, but really it depends on what type of party-centred elect electoral politics goes on, doesn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. So if, if voters or look, look at the manifestos and compare, then de decide, which, decide whether they prefer Mr. Aso or Mr. Hatoyama, then things will be s simple. But negative campaign or the negative campaign, yeah, we, uh, there's, there's a lot, lots of research about the, the impact of neg neg negative campaign on US elections, but I don't know much about how that works in Japan, so it's really difficult to see. Okay. Can I add a word on that? Oh, sure. Two yeah. words. Um, one is, people are not voting for the DPJ, as far as I can tell. They're voting against the LDP. Mm. So, which does not make Japan unique in any way. <laughs> <laughs> Throw the bombs no, out. No, Japan so. is always unique. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, no, but it so that I'm not sure the negative campaigning as a tactic would work because the point is people are not. I mean, unless they find you know a photo of Hatayama taking you know money from a yakuza or something like that. I mean, I just don't think it's going to work. They're voting against the LDP. It's a repudiation of that. I also think one of the lasting effects of, of Koizumi was to make policy and parties uh, 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 make, make elections a, a referendum about policies and parties. And I just saw Mainichi had a survey. It said 40 percent of the voters that they surveyed strongly felt that their vote was about the national government. And I think with you had somewhat felt it was like 49 percent. Now, they didn't have comparative figures from earlier years, but I, I suspect it's up, with the other half being those who, as you say, were voting for their local, their local guy. And in the, so the fact is, here's a huge, and, up, and among those 40 percent who thought it was strongly about the choice of the national government, 80 percent of those preferred the DPJ, I mean, which is just a, an incredible margin mm -hmm. within, the, within that segment. In the Tokyo election, the JC, the Japan Communist Party, if I remember, went from something like 11, 11 seats to six, or 11 percent to six percent, whatever, whatever it is. But mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the Japan Communist Party vote, which used to be 11 percent of the proportional representation vote, was something like six or seven percent. This is becoming, aside from Komito's vote, which is very stable, the proportional representation about 13 percent. This is becoming much more and more and more of a, really a two-party system with the Komito and what the Komito will do after the election. I mean, we don't we don't know. So I would say that the momentum toward a policy-centered and party-centered election is very clear. And, you know, I, I keep wondering, you know, the stuff I've talked to reporters who in Japan who say, if you, if you, if you look seat by seat, that the, uh, the LDP is going to get really wiped out in the single-member districts. And remember, a lot of those single-member districts that they won even if they regress to the mean of what they had, the number of seats they have were from 2005 is just extraordinary. So even if they go back to normal, they're going to lose a hell of a lot of seats. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that uh, you have to watch the, when you go look at the election trends, 2005 it ought to be thrown out of the trend because it's an anomalous election. If you look at the long-term trend, it's a secular decline in the LDP. 2005, Koizumi ran as an anti-LDP candidate, basically. I mean, it was a vote for Koizumi, not for the LDP. And uh, I don't, I think if you take those numbers out, I would guess as you, you know, in fact, you could probably chart uh, a, a long path mm -hmm. downward. The crucial question is, was the DPJ able to con uh, present itself credibly to the Japanese electorate as uh, a party that could effectively govern Japan. The LDP is able to stay in power because people don't believe the opposition can govern. So I think, and, and they've been hammering away at that theme, uh, and they're doing it now. I mean, that's why they're raising questions about uh, security policy, and the uh, DPJ is going to undermine security relations. Uh, DPJ is going to, can't govern uh, economically. So they're, they're 
their effective campaign, a negative or not, is to say, no, the DPJ really can't, can't govern this country. And I think that, that, uh, cam that theme has sort of run out of steam uh, over maybe a long period of time. It will be interesting to see you know, what the numbers show. And I would point to two things that are, I think, important. One is, um, is the selection of candidates. Uh, the, Ozawa is running the, this election campaign for the DPJ, and he's been doing it for several years now, really. And he, one of the things he spends most of his time doing is finding candidates. Mm -hmm. Almost all the candidates that the DPJ is putting up are people he selected. Uh, and he works very closely with the people like Rengo, the Trade Union Federation, with various constituency organizations. He looks for local politicians from whatever party they are, and you know, to the extent to which you have a young, say, rising prefectural assemblyman somewhere, maybe for the LDP, who's thinking about his political future, now he's thinking, well, I have a better chance of getting to the diet with the LDP, with the DPJ, than I do with the LDP. He's picking out those kinds of people. Uh, so there's a much, I'd say, the ratio of quality candidates, and that's actually a term that which some political scientists have used with Japan, has gotten a lot higher. That is, DPJ has gotten much better at putting good candidates out there. Secondly, uh, he's made, they've made huge inroads into rural areas. And if you go back and look at the votes, I mean, the safe LDP districts have all been in rural areas. That's where they pile up their uh, big majorities in the single-member districts. And I don't know yet, the upper house election was interesting because the DPJ did very well in rural areas. And whether if they can repeat that, even partially in rural areas in Japan, that will, I think, determine the outcome of the election. And actually, just one final point on that. Which, if you think about it, what does it mean for what will be left of the LDP? If, in other words, if, if the pundits are right that the LDP is going to really get hurt, what will be left of the LDP will, it seems to me, be its most conservative, most status quo, most rural, most troglodyte segment. You know? Sorry? <laughs> Well, that was the, the subtitles in the Woody Allen movie, exactly. <laughs> but the parallel, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, Bruce Klingler, is it? Miriam. Done. Forward. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you very much. Great presentations all. Uh, a two-parter for Dan. In the beginning, you said you disagreed with the perception that the DPJ is riven with factions and you know is of great concern to the U.S. Uh, but it seemed in your presentation you described sort of a, a far left, a left, and Ozawa center, which would move further from the alliance and more towards a U.N. sort of centric foreign policy, and then Mayahara as a right but limited right. So that collectively would seem to be of concern to alliance managers in the U.S. Maybe if you could be a little more reassuring on <laughs> why that shouldn't be of concern to the U.S. Uh, and then the second part is let's assume the DPJ wins a resounding landslide. You have clear majority in both houses of parliament and they have control of the Conte. What kind of Japan do we see? Is that now that we have an untwisted government, do we have a bold you know, security and economic leader in Asia, or do we continue to have a Japan in the doldrums, the, the Barney Fife of Asia and security policy? Uh, you know, what does it mean if the DPJ wins? Thank you. Well, first of all, this election is not being fought on foreign policy. Uh, and except for the LDP's attempt to make security policy at issue, that is mainly in the context that I said before, that is to question the ability of the uh, DPJ to govern, it's not foreign policy and security issues, as far as I can see, are not uh, at all a part of the electoral uh, map. I mean, that's not what voters are responding to. And I think the DPJ, if they win an election like this, their primary mandate is going to be on the domestic policy front, and that's what they're thinking about. Uh, you know, so I don't think uh, that if they have political capital to spend, they're not going to spend it on disturbing uh, the U.S.-Japan Security Alliance. They're going to spend it on attacking the bureaucracy, on issues of domestic policy, and trying to create a long-term basis for continuing rule on their part. They want, to, they, want to, they want to disrupt the LDP's access with the bureaucracy. If I were them, that's what I would do. And those are mainly about domestic policy issues. So I, I think that uh, they're not going to look to uh, cause a lot of trouble, if you will, on the foreign policy side. And they probably won't be that adventurous either. Um, but... Uh, that said, I think that the, you know, in terms of that spectrum that I laid out, what I would argue is that 
the, the sort of far left to the extent to which it exists in the uh, DPJ, I mean, uh, the ex-socialists, my point is they're not really a significant player in this party. You know, the, the, so, the f former socialists were a big, much bigger chunk of the party when it was formed in the, in the, in the 1990s. They're a diminishing part of it. Th those people have basically left uh, the Japanese political spectrum to a large extent. And of course, you know, they accepted the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty anyway. I mean, so the most fundamental issue on which the Socialist Party differentiated itself from the, uh, from the, you know, the LDP for decades, you know, they abandoned, which is, of course, part of the reason why maybe they went into long-term decline. But anyway, um, the, the, so I don't see, you know, I, I think actually the band of consensus is sort of runs from Okada to Maihara. And my argument is that if you look at their views on all these key issues, the difference is not that great. It's one of emphasis here and there. I Melkata mean, clearly tilts more in that sort of Asia, maybe UN, you, you say UN-centered. I, 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 I don't think it's UN-centered as much as it is a multilateralist approach to solving problems. So let's go deal with issues like the environment, soft power questions, environment, energy, economic growth, and so on through multilateral institutions. Let's look to uh, regional institutions, the growth of Asian regionalism. And partly that's the question of how do you respond to the sort of what is the big burning issue in Japanese foreign policy? It's the rise of China. Uh, North Korea, I think a lot of times, is almost like a surrogate for China. When Japanese are talking about North Korea, they're really talking about China. They just, just political correctness. You can't say China, you say North Korea. It's all fine to attack North Korea. You can attack them till the cows come home or till the, you know, the whatever, pick your farm animal of choice in Japan. Um, but, uh, but China's a little more careful. So what was the LDP's approach to the rise of China generally was let's get closer to the United States. Let's hug the United States closer. So that was Koizumi. Let's you know send a meaningless delegation of uh, contingent of troops to Iraq where they have to be protected by uh, Dutch and Australian soldiers. But hey, we bought ourselves uh, something really important with those 500 guys. We bought ourselves uh, a, a U.S. that's going to back us in uh, dealing with a rising China. And I think to, in some ways it was, it, there was a very cynical approach even on the part of the LDP government in that sense. I think the view, the, the, the consensus view in DPJ foreign policy circles is that strategy doesn't really work all that well. We ended up getting ourselves uh, t entangled in things that weren't in our national interests like the war in Iraq. Um, and you can't really, we're, we're getting drawn into this sort of China containment strategy, and certainly one that Abe and some others uh, and the, had tinkered with. Their view is, you know, yes, we're worried about a rising China. Ozawa can talk to you about Chinese military buildup too. But, you know, I think maybe they have a misplaced sense of confidence that they can deal with this through diplomatic engagement. But I think their approach, and frankly, it's the same approach I think you saw from Fukuda. Uh, and to some degree, a little bit, Abe was forced to emulate that, is that, you know, we need to deal with uh, our tensions in our relationship with our immediate neighbors. Uh, not through uh, drawing lines of confrontation, even though we realize there are issues on which we have serious problems. And I think that's why I emphasize the importance of historical questions. I really believe that you can't uh, make progress in, uh, in, in the dealing with Sino-Japanese rivalry, which I regard as the primary security problem in Northeast Asia. North Korea is way secondary to that, in my view, uh, without being able to find some way of dealing with the problem of the past. And I believe that a DPJ government, only a DPJ government, if you will, is really capable of doing that. And, and may, that may be the greatest advantage we get out of a, a change, from a foreign policy point of view, of getting a change in government. James Ross, Center for International Relations. I thought the presentations were absolutely terrific. Um, and Mr. Katz's points on the demographic issues facing Japan were especially interesting. Um, if you look at other countries facing um, native-born birth rates, um, places like Great Britain and France have also had falling birth rates below 2.1 um, children, uh, but they have been um, supplemented by liberal immigration policies, um, which have allowed you know, Great Britain to continue to grow, um, while Japan has not. If you look at you know New York and London, they both have um, populations where 40% of the population is born outside the country, while Tokyo is less than 5%. Um, and 
um, if the DP, DPJ wins the election, do you think um, there's going to be a shift in uh, Japanese immigration policy towards a more liberal version? Thank you. I don't know. I mean, it's just, I just haven't looked at, at that. But um, but if you look at the countries that have had some success in raising the native-born birth rate, so which is France and, and Sweden, for example, one of the things they've done besides all this financial stuff that the DPJ is copying in terms of making it easier, making children more affordable, women get to work. You know, if you look at polls of women in terms of what age, of Japanese women, at what age would they like to get married? How many children do they want to have? They want to get married at 25 and they want to have two kids. But they actually, in real life, marry at 29 and have one kid or eight-tenths of a kid, you know? And um, so people aren't getting what they want. And one of the reasons, you know, the men work forever. Well, they're at the job forever. Working is a different issue. But they're on the job forever, so they're not helping out at, at home. Um, there are money issues. There are cost of education issues. There are career women who, you know, want to feel free and don't want to be tied down by, you know, some guy doesn't want to talk to him, works 14 hours a day, doesn't come home and talk to her. Uh, they can't get the job they want. They can, they can get, there's a gap now of women can get a higher and higher level of education than ever before, but they can't get jobs commensurate. It's a lot of frustration. T to my mind, actually, the so-called revolutionary class in Japan are these educated women who are very, very frustrated. Right? And it would be very interesting to see the gender gap in terms of this election, and particularly among that age cohort. And what the, you've done is, if you force it to be a choice between you can work or you can have children, because if you're on a career track and you have a baby, then you're off the career track and you never get back on, then, then you have fewer babies. On the other hand, if you make it possible to have uh, work, child care stuff at big companies or other things that are done in terms of child care, then it was make it possible to have a career and family, for some people it's actually just a job and family because they need the money. It's not just a wonderful career. But you make these things possible in addition to these financial aids of education, whatever. That's where it's been most successful in terms of uh, reviving at least somewhat the, the native born birth rate, I mean, which is still not that great anywhere, even in these places. It's, it seems like it's a hard thing to do. As far as the immigration issue, I'm mean, sorry, I just, I just haven't looked at the DPJ and, and that issue, but I think. I suspect people would rather try to address the native-born issue first, and I would think this question of, of jobs and careers. The, the, the DPJ is engaged in heavy pandering to the kind of people who are opposed to opening up Japan to more immigration. I mean, the traditional trade unions, the Rengo uh, Federation type of trade unions, as well as to in rural areas. So aside from you know the issue of depopulation of rural areas, which tends to to incur some degree of immigration. So I don't think the DPJ is going to take leadership on, on that issue. I wouldn't anticipate it. Question up back there. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Stuart Bale, and I'm from um, Stanford University. So let's look at the other end. Let's say there's a crisis in confidence for the DPJ or a scandal. Um, and there's only a five or six point swing, and the LDP manages to eke out some sort of um, once in a lifetime uh, uh, miraculous victory. Uh, <laughs> what are we going to see? Um, are, are we going to see an LDP taken over by the reformist wing? Are we going to see also stay in power? Um, I, mean, I mean, what kind of changes would we see? Good, thank Craig. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought about it. Pro probably also will continue because I mean, most people in the LDP are now thinking they will go opposition. Then, if the miracle happens, then there's no. I mean, there's no reason to bring down also. So, probably the current uh, leadership will continue. But I don't know. Never thought. I, mean, about I, I think uh, you know, let's just say a, a narrow LDP victory, which is the only kind I can conceive of. Um, I, I don't see I don't see any change in leadership at that point, but I I think the uh, you, you're going to get people are worried about paralyzed government in Japan. Mm -hmm. You will get completely paralyzed government yeah. at that point because then the DPJ yeah. has no reason to cooperate in anything. They will hold up every piece of legislation that you know that, that's out there. So 
Right, I would right. say that what you would get is early elections. You know, a lot of people talk about double elections next summer. You know, they have an uh, upper house election scheduled for next summer and a, a LD, uh, you know, call another uh, 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 lower house election at that point. That seems to me the, uh, the most realistic scenario for double elections is the one you just described. Um, and as far as the reference, there, there is no more reference wing of the LDP. The Koizumi children, <clears throat> even if the LDP wins out a, a victory, the LDP children not only are going to lose elections, but um, in one of the districts, I forget where, the, the LDP took one of the assassins and said, you're no longer a candidate. We're bringing back Koryuchi, who's one of the famous postal rebels. So actually uh, about 20,000 of the lower rank and file LDP members quit the party, <clears throat> which is, you know, place that DPJ can get some votes. Actually, the DPJ is running in more places than they used to run, which is another factor. But, you know, I mean, I think the reformist wing as a vital force in the LDP will exist under any scenario, even less so than they do today. You, you know, Ozawa's original strategy uh, was, I don't think I'm giving away a secret here, uh, was, what, was what he was hoping for was uh, that that he would, they would win the upper house election, um, and that it would trigger a split uh, in the LDP, and that you would have party realignment, and that he would gain power, DPJ would gain power that way. Uh, at least that was what he was thinking leading into that. Uh, I, I don't think he. I think once they won such a big victory in the upper house election, which I'm not sure even he anticipated, then it became conceivable just to go for power without. Realignment, although he did play around with, you know, Grand Coalition, some of that stuff. So it's not like he hasn't thought about that. So one and other scenario here is that if we get a really narrow election and maybe where neither party uh, has a majority and you've got some floating votes in there, that you could have a the, the other scenario, which people in Tokyo love to engage in these <laughs> speculations, uh, is that you get some form of party realignment and you get chunks of these parties floating around and, and realigning each other. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. We can have lots of fun and entertain us. <laughs> okay. Uh, Don Oberdorfer. Dan, could you explain why you think that uh, the Sino-Japanese problem is the most serious issue in Japanese foreign policy in the 21st century? Be because for, for Japanese, you know, the the, the as I said in the beginning, I mean, you know, Japanese are endlessly thinking about what is their place in the world uh, and what is their status as a as a great power. I mean, it's been a, a you know a, a constant of Japanese foreign policy discourse going back to the Meiji era. And you know, the, what the rise of China does is it it challenges the Japanese on almost every front. It challenges their status as the uh, leading power in Northeast Asia, which has always been, I think. <laughs> You know, sort of an essential goal of Japanese foreign policy. It uh, it creates. You know, we've never had historically a time in which Japan and China have been sort of on the rise at the same time. One has always been ascendant, and the other descendant historically. So it's actually the first time historically when the two powers have been, in some sense, great powers at the same time. And I think that the there's no question if you talk to Chinese, uh, they have a heavy preoccupation with their own claim to leadership. Uh, in, in the region and see Japan as their uh, principal rival and Japanese are obsessed uh, with China. I, I can't, it's hard to have a conversation in Japan about foreign policy and security issues that doesn't become a conversation about China. Uh, so I, I think that the, and, and there are, I think the burden of the past is a huge one. Uh, you, know, J you know, Japan invaded China, uh, took possession of huge chunks of it. Uh, for Chinese, uh, the, the, the Sino-Japanese War remains a kind of template uh, for, uh, their, uh, for their downfall, if you will, and, 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 and their, their status as a, as a power. So I think that the issues of the past are wound up very tightly in even current sense of rivalry. And I think the potential for tension and conflict, even war, uh, exists coming out of that. I mean, there are little, there are areas of tension that we see, whether it's over the oil and gas fields in the islands in the East China Sea, or it's, um, you know, I issues of uh, uh, 
uh, leadership on, on any number of, of global questions in which the Chinese see that, for instance, environmental issues in which they see Japan in some sense as a rival there, or energy. There's a, a lots of areas of tension. They don't necessarily lead to conflict. Uh, but I think they're very difficult to manage. And I think the United States has a particular problem because on one hand, of course, we're, we're a security ally of the Japanese. On the other hand, we're engaged increasingly in a, a very deep relationship with China, which in some areas is one of partnership and other areas is one of competition. And there's a, a tugging on the United States from both sides. Uh, and so I think that uh, both sides would like to draw the United States sometimes into being the mediator uh, of, of conflict between them. Uh, so it, I think it, it poses a lot of challenges uh, for, for U.S. foreign policy. And you can see it in Japan in the reaction to this uh, talk about group of two, which I think is an overblown a concept that doesn't have any real basis to it, but it spun lots of Japanese totally off into the, you know, stratosphere trying to contemplate what that meant, you know, that what, was, was the United States going to abandon uh, Japan? And I think the fear of abandonment has always been a part of the U.S.-Japan relationship uh, going back a long ways, and along with that, it feeds those people in Japan who argue uh, that uh, Japan needs to provide for its own security, including potentially with nuclear weapons. So I think all these things are pieces of that. Uh, and f at least from my point of view, I, I think that's, to me, the dominant, will be the dominant issue that we're, that from American point of view, that we're going to have to deal with in the region. Let me add something on that. I mean, I, uh, I'm in harmony with, with Dan's view. Uh, I mean, I, but I look at it from sort of the economic standpoint, which is that China, I mean, the entire economy of Asia, I mean, China is such a dominating player. If you look at, it's very interesting, you look at Japanese exports to Asia, offshore Asia are dependent on China's exports to the U.S. because there's this supply chain in which China is a, more and more of a hub. And nations in terms of trade relations, direct investment relationships, financial relationships, uh, and then energy I think will be a very big issue in an era, era of scarcity. Water becomes a big issue orienting more and more towards China because Japan is not growing, is not importing. Uh, China imports much, much more from these countries than Japan does. Greater China invests much more in the rest of Asia than, than Japan does. And I think not containing China, because I think it's a nonsense concept, but integrating China, you need a strong, economically vibrant Japan as a counterweight, which I think the other nations in Asia would like to see. But in the absence of that, China becomes much, much more of a dominating presence, which raises an interesting question for the U.S., because the U.S. has a security interest in a strong, vibrant, economically vibrant Japan, but also the U.S. tends to like a Japan that sort of does, you know, what the U.S. would like it to do. Now, the thing that was really beautiful about Koizumi from the Washington standpoint is that he wanted to make Japan economically vital again, and he also agreed with a lot of what Washington wanted to do on foreign policy, or at least acted as if he did. So he was great. But we traditionally had this trade-off between what were America's security interests vis-a-vis -vis Japan, and what were economic interests in Japan, and always fights between the you know, state Pentagon on one side and the, the economic guys on the other side, whatever. And this came up in the Hosokawa period. We, we, we contributed to the downfall of that regime by our trade era relations in the Clinton era. And I think one of the things we have to think about in terms of the U.S. attitude towards a, a DPJ government is whether assuming Dan is correct about the foreign policy, which I, of course, do, um, that whether excess alarmism about the DPJ and foreign policy leads us to ignore changes which, in a very messy interregnum lasting a few years, will be very messy. But in fact, are the, is the messy interregnum Japan needs to become economically vital again, which is also a fundamental U.S. security interest? Do we get back into that trade-off or we find a better way to, to mix metaphors to square that circle. And so I think the whole issue of China, Japan's relationship to China, the counterweight in Asia, all that stuff, I, I think uh, notwithstanding that having nuclear North Korea being able to hurl missiles around is certainly in the short term very big concern about anybody, I would think. But I do think in the long term, yeah, China is it. How you deal with China? Hi, Bill Breer, retired Foreign Service Officer. Uh, I, uh, just following up on something that Dan said, just a comment. Uh, one thing that China and Japan do have in common is that they are the two biggest uh, creditors of the United States. 
and so uh, uh, something that we we can't forget, you know. Right. We, uh, but uh, I, uh, Richard, I just wanted to ask you. Uh, Dan mentioned that uh, political uh, uh, foreign affairs uh, advisors to the uh, DPJ government, uh, DPJ uh, itself. Uh, who are the economic and financial advisors to the party? Do, are there any people of any of the same sort of status stature that? Uh, well, the most famous one who may become finance minister is uh, Sakaki Bara. And he's their top candidate to become finance minister. Now, the thing is, he's an expert on certain sorts of issues. But the finance ministry's power is a lot less, a lot narrower than it used to be. And his particular expertise is really sort of the international finance. He's not a guy who does you know, domestic economic revival. He's with how Japan deals in the world stage. And um, the guy who's currently their shadow foreign minister has made a lot of irresponsible comments and no one expects him to actually become finance minister. On the domestic scene, it's interesting to try to find some big stars who, who would be, say, to a DPJ what the Takanaka was to Koizumi. I don't see them. I'm trying to discover them. But there are a number of sort of lesser lights that no one's ever heard of who are really sharp people. I mean, there, there's a friend I have who's a former finance ministry bureaucrat. Now, my image, I know the DPJ is all into bashing bureaucrats, but the reality is that some of the smartest, most radical reformers in Japan are these 45-year-old bureaucrats or former bureaucrats who as individuals have got terrific ideas, but then who do their job. And I'm sure no foreign service officer in America has ever had a similar problem or no one working in a corporation. So a lot of these guys have left the bureaucracy and, and, and have run for office, and some of the course lost in 2005. But there are these people around. And they're really, really smart. I mean, one of the problems the DPJ has is it has no secretariat to speak of. Diet members don't have a staff because under one party system. Why would you give the opposition a staff? You don't have independent think tanks that can then become in and out, you know, governments in exile. They have ties with some academics. I'm hearing from certain bureaucrats that in terms of the DPJ creating networks within the bureaucracy, again, particularly among younger bureaucrats. And so I think there are sort of these lesser lights, but as far as who would, but you really do need somebody who's really powerful on this stuff, and in terms of someone who could play the kind of role that, that Takanaka played for Koizumi, I really don't know. I mean, maybe Dan has a better idea, but I just, I don't know, or my this on? No. no. Okay, great. Um, we're slightly over time, so we'll uh, take, take one last question. Um, Ayako, you had a question. Can you? Uh, up, up the back here. Up the back, the lady in the um, Sorry. <laughs> Hi, uh, this is Ayako Doi, uh, Japan Digest. Um, the, Richard was just uh, um, preparing for my question, <laughs> um, preparing the ground for it, but uh, um, the question is about the bureaucracy. Um, you didn't very well discuss uh, you know, what the DPJ's uh, relation to the bureaucracy might be. <laughs> Um, some people even think that the uh, arrest of uh, Ozawa's secretary was a uh, prosecutor's uh, trick to you know, keep the DPJ yeah. from coming to power. And then you hear all kinds of stories about the uh, bureaucrats sort of, uh, you know, desperate <laughs> about uh, the prospect of a DPJ coming to power. Uh, is that really so? Or I don't know. And, uh, you know, what would the... What would the relationship with the DPJ government and the bureaucrat be, um, perhaps uh, particularly in terms of foreign, foreign ministry? Yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting question to me also, and I've been asking it to friends in Japan. You know, I'm sure that the Gaimasho bureaucracy, I, I say this with a fair degree of personal certainty, is not overjoyed at the prospect of the DPJ coming to power. Now, part of that is, you know, they have a familiar relationship with the LDP. They have long standing. Uh, they, they can manage foreign policy very, fairly readily with the LDP. They know how to do that, even though there have been some shifts of power. And after all, in the Koizumi administration, there was a fair amount of shift of power away from the Gaimusho to, to Kante. And, and I don't think it's entirely been a smooth relationship, even, even with the LDP. Uh, but I'm sure there's some degree of protecting of entrenched and long familiar interests. And by the way, that extends to the friends, their friends in Washington as well, who I believe 
are somewhat alarmed at the, their alarm at the approach of a DPJ government in part derives from the fact that they don't know these people. So they don't have relationships. Um, so I think that, that, that that's certainly there. Having said that, and, and so I expect there, there to be some tension, um, particularly in the early period. But having said that, uh, there's a long history. There are plenty of bureaucrats who've aligned themselves over the years personally with people like Ozawa and also even with opposition parties. The, the, the bureaucracy is much more differentiated than uh, it might appear to be from, from a distance. It isn't a sort of solid, uh, cohesive block of people who, you know, the Iron Triangle kind of concept. I think there's a lot more d diversity there. And as Rick said, there's, you know, younger bureaucrats who uh, are, are more reform-oriented and even on foreign policy issues. I mean, I, you can use the example of Tanaka uh, Hitoshi, who's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm very close to the DPJ, and I, I think there, there are other, I, I don't want to name names, but I know some other senior Gaimusho officials who have close relationships to people in the DPJ, so I don't think it'll be uh, a, an all-out war, if you will. And if you're the DPJ, I mean, think about how do you turn, you have some concepts, right? How do you actually turn concepts into policy? You need some expertise. Well, where is the expertise? They don't have their own headquarters staff. They don't have think tanks. They have some contacts within academia. Um, the Diet members have no staff. They really have no choice but to use the bureaucracy. I think their point, I mean, it's really a bit of a, um, a tatamayahone issue, right? I mean, you want to bash the bureaucrats because you want to get elected. But at the end, when you need expertise, you need these guys, right? So the idea is... It's like running against Washington. I mean, yeah. everybody but, does. Uh, but what they're talking about is a, is a cabinet-centered government, in which, way is in, in, which in a sense is the continuity of what Koizumi did, which is say the prime minister runs the country rather than this, this stove pipe or chimney, whatever, parallel chimney is a bureaucrat. So if you begin to centralize power within the cabinet, within the prime minister's office, and you send a few politicians to the bureaucracy and you establish your networks, and you, it's a question of not so much destroying the bureaucracy, but of using it. And they, ha they have to have a relationship with the bureaucracy. And frankly, the bureaucracy has to have a relationship with the government. This is very different from 1993. In 1993, Ozawa took people out of the LDP, but if you actually look at the Diet members who were elected, I mean, not that many of the Diet members changed, even though the parties changed because the diet members are shifted from parties. This is a total difference. This is a voter repudiation of the LDP. The bureaucracy has to learn how to be a professional bureaucracy, like as in a British system, and to be able to say, well, politicians come and go, but we remain, but our job is to give expertise to the politicians. That's, again, part of the interregnum, but, but they do need each other in the end. Excellent. Okay, well, um, we've grossly run out of time now. So um, if you'll join me in thanking our guests, Cole Maida, Dan Schneider, and Richard Katz. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm sure some of you will have uh, questions of your own for our guests. So if you would, uh, if they would be so gracious as to give you a couple of minutes of your time, then uh, please come up and ask them.